Yeah, Laurel Richardson, if we haven't had the opportunity to meet, I'm the Director of Community Outreach for the CMTA. We are incredibly excited about the information that's being shared today. It's been a long time coming, um, and I'm really happy to um, have our wonderful guests with us here today and, and thrilled to turn it over to our Chief Research Officer, Catherine Forsey. Thanks, Catherine. Thank you, Laurel. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to this Shaco Marie Tooth Association Lunch and Learn. This is our, part of our education series. Uh, okay. We've got people joining us from all over the world today. So whether it's lunch you're enjoying or your evening meal or perhaps just a cup of tea, I'm really happy to see you all and thank you for joining us. Uh, today we're going to be covering the recent update to the neurotoxic medication list. So I'm Dr. Catherine Forsey, as Laurel said, I'm the CMTA's Chief Research Officer, and I'm hosting today's webinar, supported, of course, by my, co my colleague Laurel, who's our Director of Community Outreach, and i um, very grateful to Laurel for organising this webinar and giving us all the opportunity to be here today. So this is what we've got in store for you. I'm going to first provide a really brief overview, and then I'll be introducing our presenters, the Guido Cavletti, MD, and Paula Alberti, MD, PhD, and they'll be providing a summary of the CMTA-funded review of the neurotoxic medications list. And they'll be covering a brief introduction to what is neurotoxicity, um, we'll touch on the previous neurotoxic medications list that was been around for a long time that many of you might be familiar with. We'll talk about how this new um, systematic research was undertaken, uh, what they learned during that research process, and then we'll finish with the new list and the updated guidance for the CMT community before we go into an open Q&A session. So please could I ask everybody to keep your microphones muted at all times, just to make sure that we can hear our presenters really clearly. Everybody is really welcome to post their questions into the chat. So as we're presenting, as you're listening, if you have any questions that come up, please, please use the text chat function on Zoom to add them. And Laurel and I are gonna be collating those and we'll put them to our presenters during the open Q&A section at the end. I'd like everybody to I'd like everybody to please bear in mind that um, we will only be able to provide general information as it relates to the updated neurotoxic medications list. We're not able to provide any personal or individualized medical advice. So this webinar on the neurotoxic medications list and our published materials on this topic, None of them constitute personal medical advice. So we'd like to make sure that you know you should always discuss treatment options with your own personal physician. Um, the drugs list that we'll be talking about is not a list of drugs that the CMTA recommends individuals who have CMT avoid. This list is provided for informational purposes so that all of our community members can have an informed conversation with their healthcare provider about medication decisions. So with those caveats now shared, I'd really like to introduce this topic area and our presenters. So the CMTA recognizes our community's desire to have access to information on possible neurotoxic side effects of some commonly used drugs. For over 15 years, the CMTA has published a neurotoxic medications list and that's based on the available data and the guidance of clinical professionals. So as you know, clinical and scientific knowledge advances every day, every year. And in 2022, the CMTA commissioned a new review to enable an evidence-based update of the neurotoxic medications list. This 2022 review was conducted by Guido Cavletti and Paolo Alberti, their work was completed in 2023 and it was published as a peer-reviewed manuscript in the Journal of the Peripheral Nerve Society on May 30th, 2023. And this was reflected in updates to the CMTA website and shared with the community via a press release. 
This work was also presented via an abstract poster at the Peripheral Nerve Society conference in June to inform and gain feedback from the CMT clinical community. And here we are now today at our CMTA hosted webinar. So we're really pleased that you've all joined us to find out more. We'll pop some links into the chat of the publications that I've just mentioned so that you can have a deep dive into them once this webinar is finished. So I'm really grateful to our two presenters and leaders of this neurotoxic drugs review. So Guido Cavletti, MD, and Paola Alberti, MD, PhD, who've joined us today from Italy, and they're sharing their work and their findings. So Guido is a professor of human anatomy at the School of Medicine and Surgery at the University of Milano, when oh, I can't pronounce this one very well, Guido, I'm really sorry, um, Biocca? And chair, you're giggling at me, and chair of the Toxic Neuropathy Consortium of the Peripheral Nerve Society. Paolo Alberti is an assistant professor at the same university and a member of the Toxic Neuropathy Consortium. Both of them work as neurologists, so they see patients at the um, San Gerardo University Hospital in Monza, Italy. I'd now like to hand straight over to Professor Cavletti and Dr. Alberti for the main part of this session. Oh, thank you so much for, for your presentation. Uh, actually, the right name is Bicocca. It might sound difficult to be pronounced, but it's the name of a, an old uh, industrial headquarter in Milan, where we have very heavy industries and now is the site of our uh, university. It's a fairly young university, as you can see here. We are just at our uh, 25th uh, year of activity. So we are fairly, fairly young. Um, let's start with a few words on the reason for investigating uh, toxic neuropathies and uh, which might be the features and the importance of uh, toxic induced neuropathies in, uh, in general population uh, and to discuss whether this might represent uh, a separate and more severe problem for patients with uh, pre-existing neuropathies, specifically CMT. It's very clear that uh, patient with pre-existing neuropathy can experience symptoms that might be relevant. And it's uh, as well very clear that several toxic agents can induce something that might resemble the same symptoms of uh, inherited or acquired neuropathies from different origins. So uh, what happened is that we met in uh, 2022 at the Peripheral Nerve Society annual meetings in Miami and uh, Lorraine contacted me because we, within the Peripheral Nerve Society, there are two very active special interest groups. One that is uh, uh, the most closely related to the CMTA and it is the Charcot-Marie II and related neuropathy special interest group. And the other is the Toxic Neuropathy Consortium that I, uh, I'm glad to, uh, to chair. And from the combination of the two, we decided that that should be the good occasion and the good, the good site to uh, enter into something that is not so clear even now. That it's why and how toxic agents can damage the peripheral nervous system and uh, why the peripheral nervous system can be so prone to develop toxicity while the central nervous system is protected. The reason is very simple. Uh, most of the toxic agents are not able to enter into the brain because the brain is protected by uh, what is called the blood-brain barrier. That is a very complex anatomical structure that prevents uh, most of the large molecule that might be might be dangerous for the for the neurons to enter into the brain. If this is true for nearly whole the central nervous system, this is not really true for several parts of the peripheral nervous system, and that is why several toxic agents are so able to damage the nerves while they are not able to damage the brain. Here in this very simple cartoon you can see uh, at the top a sensory neuron that is the one uh, here with a strange shape that is uh, 
resembling uh, a sort of T with a cell body and two different axons, one that is going to the periphery and one that is going to the central nervous system. And on the other side, this is the sensory, the sensory pathways all follow this line. And then the motor output, it's more simple because there are motor neurons that stands within the central nervous system. So they are protected from the blood brain, by the blood brain barrier and they innervate the muscles. From this very simple scheme, uh, we can understand that you have at least three sites where the blood nervous system barrier is not working and toxic agent can have access to the system. Two of these doors are quite narrow, are the receptors that are located into the skin or close to joints, in any case, in, in the periphery. The other is the, the neuromuscular plaque where modern neurons deliver the impulse to the muscles for their contraction. But the very wide door is here at the level of the sensory neurons, of the bodies of the sensory neurons. At that site, for some reason, we don't have a blood brain, a blood nervous system barrier. One can say that it's not very clever having left that door open, but anyway, this is what is the real thing. At that site, very large molecule that can be toxic can enter into the system and can be uh, dangerous for uh, for the nerves. That explains also why yeah, most of the toxic okay. most of the toxic agents. Uh, induce sensory symptoms rather than motor symptoms. This is not 100% true for all the toxic agents, but in any case, sensory impairment is predominant over the motor impairment. If we know why toxic agents can have an access to the peripheral nervous system, what is not very clear, how this toxic agent can really be active. And this is, might be extremely important because if any of the toxic mechanism can be shared by other neuropathies. In that case, a sort of potentiation of the toxic mechanism might be, might be uh, predicted. Unfortunately, we have a very limited knowledge of the mechanism at the basis of the toxicity of most of the agents. Here is just a summary, but it is no need for going into this, uh, to the description of this, of this cartoon, because these are simply hypotheses. But what might be important is that some of the hypotheses can lead to myelin damage and to damage of the cytoskeleton, the skeleton composed of uh, molecules that allow survival of axons. So this might be potentially interesting. And we will see later that uh, at least for one drug, this target, so the macrotubule, the, co the basic component of the skeleton of the axons uh, might be an important target. What makes the story a little bit more complex is that if you go uh, into the web and you simply digit uh, toxic neuropathy or toxic agent and peripheral nerves, the most likely table that you can get is something this, like this one. So it is a very, very long list of drugs, but not only drugs, also of metals that can be uh, found as a contaminants or solvents that might be used in different kinds of uh, industrial uh, activities. So it means that the world of the potential toxic agent into the peripheral nervous system is very, very wide. And the big question is, if a nerve is already being damaged by something, um, being a CMT patient or being a patient with diabetic neuropathy or what else, these nerves are more prone to develop additional damage induced by toxic agent if compared with normal nerves. So this is the starting point of our collaboration uh, to, um, to clarify uh, as much as possible this crucial point. If we go back to the original uh, list of uh, toxic medication in CMT patient, we need to refer to this paper. This paper was uh, published in uh, 2006 and uh, the background of the paper is very solid. So Louis Weimar and David Polwell 
went through the available knowledge at that moment regarding toxic neuropathies <clears throat> and uh, through an investigation across database and uh, the available literature, they completed a list of medication that is the one that you probably already know. So it's a very, very long list. It's not so different from the list I've shown you, the table I've shown you before related to the general toxicity of compounds uh, against the peripheral nerves. And they divide into defined high risk, moderate to significant risk, and uncertain or minor risk. That is not very helpful, actually, because we, we, it's difficult to, to really grade what is moderate to significant risk. But the key point is that the list is very, very long. And in, in this list, you can find antibiotics, uh, antimicrobial agents in general, um, antineoplastic drugs, statins to combat hypercholesterolemia, uh, drugs to treat hypertension or cardiac arrhythmia. So a very, very wide spectrum of diseases that might be treated with this list of, of drugs. To be honest, into the paper, at the conclusion of the paper, the authors clearly stated that recommendation that was included in that table is based on very limited direct evidence of increased risk in CMT patients. But in any case, the message was be careful with all these drugs that at the end was, uh, the result was this very, very, uh, very, very uh, busy list of uh, medication that was placed on the CMT uh, website. That was completely reasonable based on the evidence available in 2006. So there was no concern from the scientific standpoint on the recommendation that was provided by that paper. But if we look more carefully into the problem, the questions are different. And the two really pivotal questions are, one, are these drugs really neurotoxic? So do we know whether there is a strong scientific evidence for neurotoxicity for all these drugs? And if they are neurotoxic, their effects are really more relevant in CMT patients. So splitting these two questions, uh, the first question can be answered by much more recent reviews based on more solid evidence and on the increasing knowledge on the mechanism of neurotoxicity. So this is a very interesting paper, a review paper published last year by Janik Peters and Nathan Staff. Uh, Nathan actually is one of the, of the members of the board of the Toxic Neuropathy Consortium, so he's a very expert person. And after their revision, they divided the, the drugs with a strong evidence for being toxic into four main categories, antimicrobials, antiretrovirals, and a sort of mixed population of drugs. If you want to translate this new classification into the old table, I've highlighted for you here, which are the drugs that still can be considered as definitely neurotoxic. So amiodarone, that is a very active anti-arrhythmic drug. Um, DDI and D4T, that are two drugs that are part of the treatment for HIV uh, infection. Pinidoxine at very high doses. The sulfiram that is used to treat uh, alcohol abuse, colchicine for rheumatological disorders, and uh, uh, nitrous oxide uh, that is uh, part of the combination of gases that are used for anesthesia. For all the other compounds, apart from antineoplastic agents, uh, in that review, they were unable to find really strong evidence for toxicity. So the answer for to our first question is that it is not proven that most, I would say the vast majority of the drugs that were originally listed as being neurotoxic are really dangerous for the peripheral nervous system. That's the good news. So we, we why there was that confusion? Because in most cases, um, the 
potential neurotoxicity was based on single case reports. So there was a patient who was treated with a drug and developed new toxicity, and the, the causal relationship between being exposed to the drug and developing the neuropathy was considered by the author as demonstrated. But actually, this is what not the case in most of the, um, of the instances. For instance, there was not a search for alternative explanation for the neuropathy. So this is a starting point. Most of the drugs are not neurotoxic, but it is not true for chemotherapy agents. They should be considered apart from the other drugs, because in this case, we have very, very convincing evidence that most antineoplastic agents that are used to treat uh, high incidence cancer are neurotoxic. There is no discussion on that. So we need to go into some more detail regarding the mechanism of action of these anti-neoplastic drugs. This is a very, again, a very busy cartoon, uh, but I would like to highlight for you a few points. One point is this one. Most of anti-neoplastic drugs have a specific target at the level of the microtubule. So they are specifically designed to destroy and to impair the efficacy of the function of the microtubule. The other point is that demyelination might be induced by several agents, although it is not a primary demyelination. So myelin is not the primary target. But at the end of the day, also myelin can be damaged by these drugs once axons are really uh, injured. Then we have other potential mechanisms that might be important in the context of a nerve with already some damage. For instance, oxidative stress the alteration in the functionality of mitochondria. So the machine, the energy producing machinery within neurons can be a target of these drugs. And again, if a, if a nerve is damaged, probably wouldn't be happy having an additional damage due to, in this case, oxidative stress. For most of the other, of the other mechanism, it's not so clear to identify a potential relationship with uh, with CMT and uh, the pathology that it's characteristic of CMT and CMT-related neuropathies. So we can now address the second point. Uh, once we have established that some of the drug that were originally listed into the, um, into the initial list are really neurotoxic, their effects are more severe in CMT patient. I think that this is the crucial point once we have established which is the list of the drugs that we want to investigate. So this is the core of the systematic review um, we did, mostly due to the work of Paula that um, served the literature to find out any potential publication that was referring to an increased new, uh, severity of the neuropathy in CMT patients. What does it mean, systematic review? I don't know whether you, you have a clear idea of which might be the concept of systematic review. It means that someone, in this case, Paula, uh, looked for any possible publication, including keywords into, uh, into a system that is allowed to surf across different database. And uh, the result of this search uh, was that she found nearly 1,000 publications that potentially uh, could highlight the, the increased susceptibility of CMT patient after exposure to a toxic drug. The next step is that she went through all the papers and she looked for uh, what is called eligibility. So meaning whether really into the paper, there was something that could be used in order to identify uh, a high risk of developing neuropathy, more severe neuropathy in CMP, CMT patient. At the end of this screening, uh, 56 papers actually remained as available for the investigation for different reasons. Potentially, they were not in English or uh, the details within the paper were not sufficient to define whether there was a neuropathy or whether the neuropathy was related to CMT or there was not uh, the description of the phenotypes of the patient. So we couldn't, not, couldn't address the issue of being or not a CMT patient. So at the end of the analysis from nearly 1000, uh, Paula was able to identify 56 relevant papers. 
which was the result. No surprise at all. Vincristine definitely is more neurotoxic in patients with Charcot Marie II uh, disease. Uh, why not surprise? Because the first description of increased um, severity of neuropathy in Vinc following Vincristine administration in CMT patient uh, was reported in 1984. Uh, I don't remember whether Paula was already born in 1984. Anyway, I was. <laughs> and uh, so no, no, really no surprise at all. Um, this is very, very clear. And there is also a reason why uh, vincristine was identified so early because vincristine is a very old drug and vincristine is widely used in children, mostly for the treatment of some kinds of leukemia. So the, the population that was exposed to, uh, to vincristine administration is a population of uh, high risk person with CMT. And in some case, CMT was discovered after the administration of vincristine, just because there was an unexpected severe course of the neuropathy. And after the beginning of the chemo, with the development of more severe toxicity, the screening was done, the genetic screening was done, and a CMT patient was identified. So no surprise at all with vincristine. The second candidate that was uh, identified as high, potential high risk into the original publication is uh, was paclitaxel. So the commercial name is Taxol. Uh, the importance of paclitaxel and taxane, that is the big family, including also paclitaxel, is that it's uh, extremely effective in, uh, for instance, in breast cancer. So it's a cornerstone of the chemotherapy schedule that is able to completely cure patients with breast cancer. So it's a very, very potent agent and it's a very widely used patient. In this case, we faced uh, some trouble because the case reports, uh, the original case reports, um, actually, actually was only one, while all the other studies were retrospective. So the point is that we found only retrospective studies with conflicting results. So not all the, not all the studies agreed on an increased risk of developing neuropathy. And in none of these studies, particularly in the retrospective studies that were larger, there was a search for alternative diagnosis. So patient develop toxicity or develop neuropathy, but the, their doctors were not looking for another potential explanation. There is a bunch of potential explanations if patients who develop severe neuropathy. Uh, in cancer patients. For instance, what is called Guillain-Barré syndrome, that is a very severe sensory and motor neuropathy that can develop over a few days and can be, uh, can be lethal. So it's very, very severe. But in that case, you need to uh, investigate, for instance, the cerebrospinal fluid to look for inflammatory markers. And uh, it was never done in all these studies. So potentially it can be dangerous, mostly because it targets tubulin exactly as vincristine, although with a completely different mechanism. But uh, the suggestion is to be, to take some caution because there is no solid evidence that it, it's neurotoxic. But the very good news came from the investigation of all the other drugs. In that case, this is a list, no need for going to the list that it's quite boring. And if some of you uh, would like to go into the details, it's published into the paper that uh, Kathleen showed us before. But what is important is that we have only case reports. Most of them stated that there was no specific risk. So we can consider this list as a very, very good news because we were not able to find any real evidence of increased risk of toxicity in CMT population. This does not mean that these drugs are not neurotoxic. Simply means that they are neurotoxic in CMT people exactly as in non-CMT people. So coming to the end, the results of our study is that we have provided evidence-based support for the statement that vincristine is dangerous and possibly paclitaxel, so taxol, can occasionally induce more severe cause of toxicity in CMT patients. No convincing evidence for similar recommendation 
could be found in any of the other drugs. So which is the interpretation of our data? First message, I think it's extremely important for all the CMT patients. Uh, CMT patients should not be denied effective treatments if this treatment may prolong their life for anti-cancer drugs or improve their health status. The second message is that in any case, monitoring of peripheral nerve function in CMT patients treated with any neurotoxic agent is extremely important, should be done. But I would add that this should be done in all patients, not specifically in CMT patients, but in all patients. So again, CMT patients are not different from patients without CMT under this perspective. And from our side as neurologists, we must monitor CMT patients in order to detect any evidence of something that we missed so far. So it might be that some of this drug can share and increase toxicity, but it should be so subtle that we are not being able to capture. Means that it might not be clinically relevant. Uh, and in any case, a report of any, let's say, strange neuropathy progression should be reported in order to, uh, to, to keep monitor the situation. What's the next step? Uh, probably the only way to uh, completely address the issue is to plan the prospective data collection. So working on CMT patient database at the specific uh, question related to what happened once patient had been treated with drugs in order to see whether we can get prospective data. Because from the scientific standpoint, retrospective data can be useful because you can have large numbers. But in most cases, the quality of the data is not sufficient to provide solid evidence. So you have feelings, but not necessarily uh, strong evidence of something. The only way to get this kind of solidity is to go for prospective data collection focused on a specific topic. In this case, drug-related toxicity. But at, that, at this point, my, my message, and I think this is a message, message shared also by Katrina and Paola, is that only for brain Christine, there should be concern. That does not mean that patients should not be treated with brain Christine, but means that discussion should be done on the real risk to benefit uh, for patient, from patient to patient. And in case of something that might be uh, disadvantageous, considering other vinca alkaloids. So no need for remaining on vincristine. There are also other vinca alkaloids. And again, the discussion with the hematologist in this case should be very, very open to clearly see which is the risk to benefit uh, ratio and in any case, this population of, of patients must be monitored much more closely than in all the other cases. Um, for Paclitaxel, the, the message might be more or less the same. If we will be able to see whether patients with Paclitaxel really remain within the same range of toxicity that we know is the range of toxicity and severity of non-CMT patient, uh, that, would be, um, that would be achieved only collecting new data in the future. But at the moment, there is no reason for avoiding the use of taxane in the treatment of someone who has a CMT diagnosis. And the reason is very clear. In this case, the risk to benefit uh, is that the amount of benefit is so high and the risk is so low that in my opinion, in 99.9% .9 of the patient, the ratio would be definitely in favor of using the drug with monitoring for sure, but not preventing a patient to be treated with such a very effective compound. And from my point, I wish to thank you for your attention. If you might have some question, not today, but in the future, this is my email. So feel completely free to send me emails. Uh, and uh, of course, I will not be able to provide you, uh, as Kasim was saying before, a personal diagnosis or personal suggestions on the treatment. But if you have something that you would like 
to ask me in the future, feel completely free to uh, to send me an email. And, and as we were saying at the beginning of our webinar, now I'm completely available for your, uh, for your questions. Thank you very much, Guido, for that comprehensive overview of the work that you and, and Paolo um, completed. Um, as you can see there, uh, Guido and Paolo did a very thorough search of all of the available published scientific literature to find out if there was evidence that these drugs and treatments pose any greater risk to those of us with CMT than everybody else. Um, and it's really reassuring uh, to know that there's only the one with this Christine and that we keep an eye on Paxitel um, and that we can have some confidence that the others don't pose a greater risk to us than any other person. And um, we have had um, all sorts of questions come into the chat. Most of them are listing different drugs that people are interested in. And I think what Guido's done during this session is answer all of those questions. So people asked about Cipro, um, Sertraline, Zoloft, uh, Baclofen, um, Tylenol, pain relief, um, all sorts of different treatments of uh, drugs have been listed here. And I think, um, Guido, to reiterate what you said, um, there's no greater risk to people with CMT from any of those drugs than a person without CMT. No, I, I'm going through the through the chat to look for yeah. for drugs. Uh, let me go in the right order. So let me start here. Um, okay, anesthesia. Anesthesia might be might be uh, potentially interesting, but uh, any effect of anesthesia should be related to a to a central nervous system um, impairment in functioning. So that might be interesting, but definitely there is no relation with um, with the peripheral nervous system. The statins, uh, <laughs> the stories of statins is, is very interesting because um, statins have been uh, claimed to be severely toxic on muscles years and years ago, and they actually are able to induce a myopathy in some case. And that's the reason why there is the need for uh, checking for muscle enzymes during treatment. Um, since the mechanism is related to, um, is not so closely, but anyway, is related to mitochondrial impairment and mitochondrial impairment has been reported in neuropathies. There was some suggestion that they might also be responsible for peripheral neuropathy. There are only a few um, prospective studies on the statin treated patient. Uh, at the end of the story, the risk of developing a peripheral neuropathy after statin administration is extremely low in, if any, in, in, in general population. So I don't believe that should be any concern on that. Uh, wah, wah, wah. We keep scrolling. Um, oh, we... Target drugs. Target drugs, oof, again, uh, target drugs are supposed to be extremely clever. So they're supposed to target exactly their target. This is more or less true. But sometimes they they also have some off-target um, effect that is not predictable because in most cases is um, simply due to a, simply it's due to individual um, features. So uh, I I'm, I don't believe that there should be a peripheral nervous system concern in using Ibrumica, uh, but. If if uh, if Loren had two admission to the uh, emergency room and internal bleeding, I, I I understand why oncologists are not very happy to to start again similar treatment, but not for uh, in any case not for a peripheral nervous system uh, a problem. Um, okay, let me scroll down. Oh. Okay. Oh, Cicero, I don't know uh, what, what is Cicero, uh, because I don't believe that. Paolo, do you know Cicero? That's, I don't believe that. Uh, that was a typo. That, that's Cipro. 
Um, it was a typo the first time they wrote it, and then they corrected and said Cipro Macrobid. Okay. Um, okay. So again, this class of compounds is known to be to have an effect on the on the brain functioning and can induce um, drowsiness, sleepiness, and uh, in general, uh, what is generally speaking called fatigue. So it, it is possible that patient can develop something that looks like an increase in the severity of a pre-existing neuropathy, but probably it's not due to a peripheral effect, but rather to a central nervous system effect. Oh, any comment on B vitamins? Uh, uh, wah, wah, wah. Okay, B, B12 deficiency definitely is bad. It's a very well-known cause for peripheral neuropathy and also for uh, spinal, uh, spinal cord um, damage, so my, um, myelopathy. Um, if there is no a clear deficiency in the level of B12, there is no reason for charging with additional vitamin B uh, because our, our body is done to work with that level of, of vitamins. And if we overload, uh, we simply eliminate it. So uh, if there is a, a, an, an evidence for low levels of B12, definitely should be corrected because over the long course can induce a peripheral neuropathy and uh, apart from anemia, but also peripheral nerve damage. But if there is no evidence for low levels of B12, I don't believe it is uh, of any, of any uh, use to add B12. They will be simply eliminated. Um, any NSAID or pain or pain medication? Uh, no, I don't believe that there is any concern. Consider that most patients, for instance, that are treated with chemo drugs and develop painful neuropathy actually are treated with painkillers. Um, so no, I don't believe there is any problem. Uh, Zoloft, uh, no, never reported any concern regarding the peripheral nervous system with uh, sertraline or the family of antidepressant, including sertraline. Uh, baclofen. Uh, baclofen is widely used in patients with peripheral nervous system diseases, not only with central nervous system disorders. So I would consider a safe drug in, uh, in the context of a peripheral neuropathy. What was the email? I, I will write the email later into the chat. It was added. I think we're good there. Thanks, okay. Uh, Research-based question uh, later, if you want. So we can go, we can scroll across the different drugs. Uh, Cypro probably was central nervous system effect. Uh, Drugs for colonoscopy, you mean drugs at, in the preparation of colonoscopy? Um, no, uh, we have discussed the point of uh, antimicrobial agents. This includes also the, what we can call topic antimicrobial agents that are used to clean the, uh, the intestine before colonoscopy. So I would, I would use them safely. Can AMG determine if drug is responsible? Yeah. Yes and no. Uh, actually, Paolo is a he's a neurophysiologist, so sometimes we disagree on that, but I think that we agree on this point. Uh, EMG can be used to determine whether there is a neuropathy or whether there is a change in the severity of the neuropathy. Um, it is not able to identify the reason. So, uh, so that, that, should, that, should, that should be interpreted by uh, the doctor who asked for, for the EMG. But for sure, it's, it's, it's valuable in order to identify the severity and uh, to discriminate between a myelin damage or an axonal damage. So it can be used if it's used with a very focused, uh, with a focus, very focused idea. So there is no, no sense in using EMG just to do an EMG and to have a number or, or something that is related to conduction velocity or what else. But if someone want to monitor what's happening, particularly if someone has already a neuropathy, that might be useful using uh, EMG before starting the treatment and look and monitor with the drug, with, with the EMG, once the, the, the drug is given or once the drug is withdrawn. Uh, I wouldn't advise for 
uh, a wide and unfocused use of EMG. Alternative medication to statins, not as effective as statins. There is some natural compound. Actually, natural compounds are acting exactly as statins. They're simply natural and not chemical, but they are the same mechanism of action in most cases. Um, the connection between nitrous oxide and B12 deficiency is that nitrous oxide has been demonstrated to be, to be toxic if patients are depleted from B12, uh, B12 vitamin. So that is why it's uh, safe to check for B12 level in patients who are exposed to nitrous oxide if there is any evidence. I mean, if a patient has no anemia, it's very unlikely that can have a B12 vitamin deficiency. So if, if, uh, uh, if there is anemia, that should not be explained by other reasons. So there is not a bleeding, for instance. In that case, B12 level should be measured. I was told not to take a statin due to potential impact on myelin. I strongly disagree on that advice. The reason that, <laughs> that, that that's interesting. Uh, statin could impact, I was trying to explain, uh, the statins are able to reduce the synthesis of cholesterol, but they are reducing the synthesis to the physiologic level. So they are not depleting our body from cholesterol. There is a lot of cholesterol that is available for, for creating the myelin sheet. So there is no reason at all to, uh, to avoid the use of, uh, of statins in, in this context. Uh, Okay, there is, this is everything that we face the issue of if something is negative or positive, we can see the problem from, from two different aspects. It's much more difficult to demonstrate that something is safe because you need to expose a huge amount of people to the, to the in this case, the toxic agent and to follow them for a long period of time. So it's much easier and it's the only way we can, we can actually do to look for something who has a negative outcome. In this case, you can raise suspicion of uh, potential, uh, the potential dangerous of using the drug. It, it's not so easy to demonstrate that something is safe because you need to expose 1,000 people to the drug and look for the, for the cause of this patient. It's much easier to pick up the two patients among the large cohort who developed a negative uh, event to investigate that event. Copy of the slides, no problem from my side. Uh, I think that they can be shared with anyone who, who wants. Um, COVID vaccine as a neurotoxin, no. Definitely not a neurotoxin. What can happen with COVID vaccine, exactly with, exactly as with all the other vaccines, is that uh, can induce an immune response. And among the targets of the um, wrong immune response, also peripheral nerves can 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 stand. But it's nothing to do with uh, with a toxic effect. It's simply uh, because it's a vaccine. So we can induce uh, as influenza vaccine or any other kind of vaccine, an immune response. Uh, now uh, I was scrolling, but they are adding, adding, adding. So I, oh, connection, la, 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 la. Flu shot, yes, definitely, definitely safe. Uh, much safer than not doing if you are, if you are, are with, within a high risk population. If you are 30 and completely healthy, I don't believe that there is any need for flu shot. If you are 70, uh, I would go for that. I'm, I'm going for flu shot, even if I'm not 70, but I, anyway, I'm going for that. I go for the flu shot too, Rido, and I'm not 70, <laughs> because it, it, wipes, it wipes me out and I'd rather not be wiped out. <laughs> Well, you know, in, in hospital, we are exposed and we are strongly suggested to, to get flu shots, mm -hmm. even if you are, like Paola, much younger. Uh, any neurotoxin medication that might be prescribed for ADHD? No, I, I, don't, I don't think so. It's safe, any kind of treatment for cholesterol, high, high cholesterol high. levels, provided that the level of cholesterol that will be achieved is within the physiological range. If drug you intermittent, 
Hmm. I think uh, that's from the old list, Guido. So we, the old list used to have intermediate or low risk, and now yeah, the, we don't the new have. List, it's exactly. been changed we, to just two drugs. Yeah. Exactly. So I think that, that that's the answer from our side. Vitamin that can help or hurt. Uh, don't believe that any of these can hurt. There was, I think that the, there is a study that that was done with vitamin C that failed. Um, but I don't believe that that can be really, uh, really effective in, in doing some, some benefit. Uh, in again, terms of, um, Guido, sorry to interrupt. It's just because lots of people are asking about supplements and things. Um, the the CMTA Lunch and Learn webinar before this one, so the last quarter's one, was on nutrition in CMT. And we had a, a qualified nutritionist talk about diet, nutrition and supplements, um, which if anybody like is interested in that area, she really took a deep dive into the different things that may or may not be uh, debunked some myths and, and provided some really sound uh, information. Um, Lorna, Lorna did that for us and it's available on the uh, CMTA um, webinar collection on the website and on the YouTube channel. So um, we could be able to share a link to that in the chat for if okay. people are interested in the vitamin and supplement questions. Oh, sorry. Um, fluoroquinolone, it's, uh, um, it's true. Um, you know, um, the FDA or the EMA um, safety communication are based on severe cases that have been reported. What they missed to, um, to inform is how many people was exposed to the drug before having one severe side effect. I can I can say it. I would ask you whether you know which is the most frequent reason for hepatic failure, and I don't know whether you believe me, but the most frequent reason for hepatic severe hepatic failure is paracetamol. I guess that you are taking paracetamol quite widely, and you are quite sure that it's not a dangerous drug. But if you go into the FDA safety recommendation, you will find hepatic failure among the possible severe and fatal effect of paracetamol. I think that probably all of us uh, took grams of paracetamol in their lifetime, and probably none of us never was simply thinking of a potential fatal event due to hepatic failure. So please keep this safety communication very carefully because in most cases, the communication are very based on severe cases, very, very rare. And in some cases, particularly one, when these uh, communication are given by the pharma companies, they have a very, very clear uh, protective meaning, meaning that if something will happen, you will not be able to make a class action against the company because they say, okay, but you know that it could happen. The problem is how often this could happen. Again, the discussion is related to the risk to benefit uh, ratio. Okay. And I think that the work that um, you and, and Paula have published, it, it's around, do these drugs or treatment pose any greater risk to people with CMT than the general population? Well, absolutely, yes, so that's absolutely all, true, absolutely true. All drugs. All drugs have extensive lists of potential side effects. When you get the leaflets out the packets and you read them or don't read them, they're huge and extensive. The focus here is whether or not are they greater risk to people with CMT. Um, yeah. And when we find that for the vast majority of drugs, the answer is no. Um, so then we're just looking at general side effects of drugs. And that's where you talk to your physician if you're concerned about any of them. But we, we as a CMT population, don't need to worry that we're at any greater risk than anybody else. Exactly. And I was I was just going through the, the link that some of you posted on the, the uh, on the chat. I was looking at the FDA drug safety communication. Uh, that is interesting because they, they are saying that 23 million patients received fluoroquinolones and uh, I'm, I'm unable to find here how many of them develop a clear evidence of a neuropathy. 
Um, and they are saying that the drug was put into the list of the potential neurotoxic drugs in 2004. At that moment, also the list, also our list, also the CMTA association list was much, much longer than the one we have seen here. So the point is that we can be uh, damaged by side effects of any drug, even if the, 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 the most yeah. common, but the point again is that whether the CMT community uh, patients are more prone to develop a severe toxicity, and that's the point of our review. And the answer is no, apart from Vincristin. Thank you, Guido. I think looking through that that is um, all of the all of the questions um, because we're, we're almost going back around in circles about vaccines and. You've already answered that one. Cipro, you've already answered that one. Um, let's have a look what's at the bottom. People are now just starting to say thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I'll give it a moment for any other um, any other uh, questions to come through from people uh, just as we get towards the end. So keep your eye on that and see if anything else comes up. Um, let's see if we have any further questions. Catherine, do you want to talk about Boston? Yeah, absolutely. I'm just wobbling my uh, screen around Laurel. Oh. <laughs> sure, take your time. Pass this finger first. Um, so, is it going to let me share my screen? So, just while we have everybody here with all your amazing questions that you have, um, is just to let you know that the uh, CMTA has a patient and research summit coming up. Uh, on the 4th of November in Boston. And it will also be hybrid. So if you're not in the US or near Boston or can't travel, then you'll be able to join us online. Uh, but we would love it if you could join us in person in Boston. And similar to the session that you've just had with Guido, um, we'll have a whole morning around living well with CMT and then a whole afternoon on CMT research. So if you're looking for ways to help navigate the world that is living with CMT and you want to know what we're doing, pushing research forward for treatments and understanding CMT more, come and join us in Boston and there'll be a chance to speak with a scientist like you've had today and ask them questions about what's happening for your type of CMT. Um, I've popped the QR code there for people to scan and we will put the registration link in the chat right now. So I'll stop my share and we'll check back on the uh, chat to see if any last questions have come in for, for Guido and Paolo. No, I think there are no no other questions. So I hope that means clear enough. I think that, it was, that it, information was so incredible and overdue. We're just so very glad to hear that. Um, we don't have as many questions as as originally thought because it was so clear and so well answered. Thank you all for your time and dedication to this project. We are so grateful. It was really our pleasure to to work with you and to provide some. I think some information for all the people that might be concerned about something that probably is not really a problem in any case, it should not be the problem. It might be something that should be discussed with the physician, but should not be a way to uh, avoid treating patients with something that might be helpful. Thank you so okay. much, Guido. It's been so informative. And as we say, long overdue work to really drill down into making sure we're only worrying about the things that we need to worry about. So thank you ever so much. Thanks, everyone. And I will be emailing out the recording once it is edited and up on our website, which Sarah Gentry usually does quite quickly. So stand by and check your email for that recording. And thank you all for being with us on this Lunch and Learn. There will be one more Lunch and Learn this year on September 14th, I believe, so stay tuned for that um, webinar where, where we will talk about being a patient partner in research. So stay tuned and we'll get that registration open soon. Thank you all. Guido Paolo, I know it's late. Oh, also for Catherine, late in Europe. So thank you all for being with us. Have a great it's afternoon awesome. and evening. Bye. Bye-bye.